to understand and create great poetry, uh, you, must have, you must have had a great teacher. For great poetry to enable us to live rich, fulfilling lives, you must have had a great teacher. As Milton's Paradise Lost would have it, the first teacher was the angel Raphael, who descended unto Adam and Eve and taught them the first great lesson. Be strong, live happy, and love. But we must ourselves have great teachers that illuminate such lessons for us. The invocation of the heavenly muse that begins Milton's great epic is itself the most powerful yearning to be taught ever put into words. Of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe with loss of Eden, till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat, sing heavenly muse that on the secret top of Oreb or of Sinai did inspire that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed. In the beginning, how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos, and if science hill delight thee more, O Siloas brook that flowed fast by the oracle of God, I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song that with no middle flight intends to soar above the Onion Mount while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. And chiefly thou, O spirit, that dost be fur before all temples, the upright heart and pure. Instruct me, for thy knowest, thou from the first was present, and with mighty wings outspread dove-like satst, brooding on the vast abyss, and madest it pregnant. What in me is dark illumine? What is low rays and support? That to the height of this great argument I may assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to men. Notice the verbs in this passage. Teach, instruct, illuminate, invoke, inspire, delight, sing, raise, support, assert, justify. For Milton, fundamental aspects of poetry are learning and teaching. This afternoon's speaker, Dr. John Leonard, is without question a great teacher of one of the greatest poets of all time. Dr. Leonard, too, teaches, instructs, illuminates, invokes, inspires, delights, sings, asserts, justifies, raises, and supports. So his students through literature may do all these things for others and for themselves. His achievements have made him one of the most preeminent scholars in Milton studies today. To name just a few, Dr. Leonard has edited the Penguin editions of Milton's poetry and has written Faithful Laborers, the magisterial and critically acclaimed reception history of Paradise Lost. And just this year, the value of Milton, which he's also written, has been lauded, lauded as a tour de force. In 2014, Dr. Leonard was named Honored Scholar by the Milton Society of America, of which he served as president in 2003. This Lifetime Achievement Award is the highest recognition a scholar can receive in the field of Milton studies. In 2015, Dr. Leonard was acclaimed um, a distinguished university professor by Western, which he has taught, taught for three decades and was elected fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Uh, as another great Milton scholar, Gordon Campbell, has put it, there are about a thousand Milton scholars in the world. Everyone would place John Leonard in the top half dozen, and some, including me, regard him as the world's most distinguished scholar of Milton. Nevertheless, Dr. Leonard has remained dedicated to his love for teaching students. In his own description of his scholarly interests in the Western English Department website, he emphasizes not only his research, not so much his research, rather, but that he takes special pleasure in teaching first-year classes where he can intru introduce young people to the delights of literature of all periods and genres. Indeed, I often come across students at Western whose faces light up when they talk about Dr. Leonard's, Leonard's brilliant lectures, his impassioned performances from memory of Paradise Lost, which I've tried to emulate just, just now, his British accent, uh, and his gentle, patient, and masterly guidance that he gives to his students during office hours. As his PhD dissertation supervisee, I myself have firsthand experience of being illuminated, inspired, delighted, raised, and supported by this great teacher. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please welcome Dr. John Leonard.
Thank you, George, for those kind words. Of all of the verbs you listed, of being Miltonic verbs appropriate to me, I shall try very hard not to assert too much. <coughs> um, let me start by pointing uh, behind me to those three books in the bookcase there. Um, they are on loan from uh, Western's uh, uh, William G, G, uh, sorry, G. William Stewart Milton collection of Milton and Miltoniana, which is either the fourth or the best collection of works of Milton in the world, and it's right here, here at Western. Um, so I want to start by just saying a, a, a couple of words about, uh, about those particular books that you see. Um, what you have there in, in uh, front, without, without the illustration, are for, uh, two copies of a first edition of Paradise Lost, which on the title page it says it's in 10 books. We think of it as being in 12 books. That's because in the year of his death, 1674, uh, Milton brought out a second edition of Paradise Lost where he split two of the 10 books uh, in, in half, so to make a 10-book epic into a 12-book epic. But what we have there are the, the earliest 10-book uh, version um, th those two are actually very special. One purports to be a signed copy with uh, uh, John Milton's signature. I'm frankly skeptical because Milton was blind uh, when Paradise Lost was published and the signature on that page looks rather unlike the very few other signatures that we have. Um, but I thought I would uh, uh, display it anyway. Uh, the other first edition of Paradise Lost is, ben is the Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli's personal copy. Um, so that, that's a rather, rather special edition too. Uh, but I want to start by um, uh, uh, talking about the, the other uh, uh, book you, you can see there. Um, and I, with the PowerPoint, I will, I will give you a blow up of the, of the picture. Um, it's, it's, an, it's an engraving of Milton himself. That book is um, Milton's first major publication of poetry, the uh, 1645 volume um, of poems, English, Latin, Italian, and there are also a couple of Greek poems in there too. And to just give you a sense of the context, when this book was printed, that actual edition that you're seeing there in the case, and you're free to come up and look at it afterwards, uh, England was in the, in the throes of civil war. Um, uh, it was published in 1645, which is the same year as the Battle of Naseby, where English were killing each other in one of the bloodiest battles ever fought on English soil. The remarkable thing about this 1645 edition, there is only one poem in the collection that actually mentions the war that's going on. And what I'm going to be doing in the uh, uh, 50 or so minutes that, that we have together, I'm going to be dividing the time equally between one, that one poem and uh, uh, the, in the second half be turning to, to Paradise Lost. But let's look at the title page, um, <coughs> which I've blown up for you here. Um, that's a rather unflattering portrait of the man we see here. It would have looked more like that when the time the, the portrait was done. And Milton was very vain of his personal appearance. He was a very handsome man and it's not coincidence that he's the person who coined the phrase self-esteem, which is now on everybody's lips. It was Milton who first used that phrase. He's got a lot to answer for. Um, <clears throat> but you, would, you will notice that um, underneath the portrait there's this uh, uh, <coughs> brief poem in Greek um, and it, is, uh, it was actually engraved by the artist whose name was William Marshall, then to the initials WM. But Milton wrote the poem. William Marshall um, meticulously copied the Greek script, not knowing what, what the words say. Um, Milton got his revenge for this portrait because what it actually says is this. Were you to look at the original, you would perhaps say that this likeness was made by an incompetent hand. Friends, since you cannot recognize the man depicted, laugh at the rotten picture of a rotten artist. And, and that last phrase is ambiguous in the Greek because uh, of a rotten artist can mean either, uh, it means both a picture by a rotten artist and a picture of a rotten artist, implying that Marshall has drawn a self portrait. <clears throat> but I want to start by looking at one sonnet in this 1645 volume, and um, it's, uh, it's the only poem that mentions the war that's being fought. 
Um, this poem was written, where all we can date it fairly precisely, it was written sometime in late October or early November of 1642. We know that because um, in the manuscript at Trinity College, Cambridge, it has a, a, a title, um, When the Siege Was Intended to the City. That tells us that the poem was written shortly after the, the very first battle of the English Civil War, the Battle of Edge Hill, which was a marginal royalist victory. Everybody expected King Charles I to immediately march on London, which is the parliamentarian capital, and had he done so, um, he, the war might have ended there and then in a royalist victory. Milton's house was just outside the city wall of London. And also in the manuscript version, there is a title, On His Door, when the city expected an assault. So it's been plausibly conjectured that Milton wrote the poem and pinned it to his front door as an appeal to a royalist soldier not to sack and pillage his house. Um, and um, there, it, there has, especially in the 20th century, been rather negative reception to this poem. It is not one of Milton's loved poems, though I should tell you it's now my favorite sonnet and, by, by, by Milton. Um, the reason it's not much loved is because it is, it is suspected of being a mixture of two things, both rather unattractive, uh, of boastfulness and naivety. Uh, boastfulness because Milton thinks he's special because he's a poet, and naivety because he's so foolish as to think that a royalist officer would take this poem seriously. As if a soldier would come up and say, Hold on, chaps, this is a poet's house. Cannot possibly uh, enter in here. We need an off-limits sign up here, pronto. And the whole army would, would turn, turn away. Um, Robert Graves, the great 20th century poet who hated Milton, and in 1942 published a historical novel called Wife to Mr. Milton that's written from the, from the perspective of Milton's first wife, Mary Powell, in an unhappy marriage. Robert Graves, in that novel, depicts Milton as pinning the poem to his door, it, shivering with panic, but also at the same time trying to bridle with indignation and pride as he asserts his self-importance as a poet. That image has cast a very long shadow, and Miltonists ever since 1942, and the publication of that Graves novel, have bent over backwards to try to save Milton's reputation by pretending or trying to convince themselves that the poem is a joke. So let me just, let me just read the poem to you, um, because I think the tone is everything. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to defend the poem and argue not only is it entirely serious, but it, it has a valuable and important message for us today when the arts are always beleaguered and under attack. So this is Milton's defense of poetry, among other things. So imagine that you are a captain or colonel, and you come to the front door, and this is what you read on the front door. Captain or coronel or knight in arms, whose chance on these defenseless doors may seize, if deed of honor did thee ever please, guard them, and him within protect from harms. He can requite thee, for he knows the charms that call fame on such gentle acts as these, and he can spread thy name o'er lands and seas, Whatever clime the sun's bright circle warms, lift not thy spear against the muse's bower. The great Emathian conqueror bid spare the house of Pindarus when temple and tower went to the ground, and the repeated air of sad Electra's poet had the power to save the Athenian walls from ruin bare. Beautiful uh, sestet there, though rather obscure. Um, if Milton's a very dense, uh, densely learned poet, and he, um, some people uh, uh, are put off by what they see as his, as his arrogant, in-your-face display of his erudition and learning. Um, <clears throat> the references in those last lines, there are two references to ancient Greek history. The first reference is to 335 BC when Alexander the Great uh, sacked the city of Thebes. Every house and, uh, and even temples went to, were raised to the ground. One house was spared, the house of the poet Pindar. 
Okay, Pindar hadn't been living there for several hundred years, could have been dead, but nevertheless, it was a gesture. Um, the second story comes from Plutarch, and it's a story that's told of the, uh, 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 of the fate that nearly befell Athens at the end of its uh, disastrous 30-year war with Sparta, known as the Peloponnesian War. At the end of that war, the Athenians were completely defeated, and the Spartans and their allies held a council of war to decide what, was, what to do with the Athenians. And the majority view from the Thebans, who at that time were friends with Sparta and the Corinthians, was, let's give them payback. Remember what they did to Milos a few years ago? They killed every adult male and sold all the women and children into slavery. Let's do a Milos job on Athens. And it looked as if this policy was going to prevail. When one man, who was from a minor Spartan ally city called Phocis, stood up and sang an ode from Euripides' Electra. And as Plutarch tells the story, everybody was so moved with compassion that nobody could find it in their hearts to destroy a city that had produced so much beauty, and Athens was spared. Now, whether the story is true or not, we, we don't know. The story's late. Plutarch was living about 500 years after the events. But Milton seems to have taken it seriously. Those readers of Milton who want to distance him from making this proud statement um, and want to read this poem as a joke, they tell us that there is a deliberate historical mistake in the, uh, in the poem. There's reference to the Athenian walls. It was an 18th century editor called Thomas Wharton, who in rather a spoil sport, pointed out, well, as a matter of fact, the walls were not spared. It was the one part of the city that it was destroyed. Xenophon tells us, and he goes on to give this story of the Xenophon, who was an eyewitness, of how the walls of Athens were torn down to the sound of flute music. Well, for uh, the, Thomas Walton in the 18th century, this was just a forgivable error. He just moved on. Uh, some 20th century defenders of Mil Milton, late 20th century defenders of Milton, have seen this as a deliberate error planted in the sonnet as a way of, of a clue to the cognoscenti that, of course, I don't really believe that poetry can do all the, these work, these miracles. Um, I remember, as every learned person does, that the walls did come down. It, it gave me immense pleasure in the year 1998 to point out that actually Milton's history is perfectly accurate uh, because the walls that came down were not the city wall of Athens, but the long walls. This is it, sorry, this is London in Milton's time. I'll show you where Milton's house is because the reason there's so much emphasis on walls is that Milton's house was outside the city wall of London. So you can see the wall of London here, the ancient Roman wall, and Milton's house on Aldersgate Street was there. So it, it would have been a prime candidate for demolition or uh, uh, to be a target uh, from artillery. But uh, this was the ancient Athenian wall. These are the walls that came down, the long walls. Uh, the walls of the city were, were spared. Why does it matter? other than it gives me a certain pleasure to defend Milton's historical accuracy. Well, I will go further than that. I now think not only is Milton entirely um, sincere in, this, in, this, in his historical reference in the poem, I also think his plea for poetry has lasting value for us today. Um, especially, in the, I find it rather bizarre at the time when poetry and the arts are always be under attack and beleaguered by politicians or indifference from the general public. I find it rather perverse that Milton scholars should be doing their utmost to rob this poem of its emotive appeal. So uh, let me conclude this part of my talk about this poem with a real life parallel that happened just three years after Robert Graves' novel was published, though uh, no one has connected it with Milton's poem. Um, the events I'm going to refer to happened at the final days <coughs> of World War II. <coughs> at this house, number 42 Zoppitstrasse, in the Bavarian village of Garmisch, which had 
uh, escaped the um, ravages of World War II because of its seclusion. But on April the 30th, 1945, which coincidentally was the same day that Hitler committed suicide, the uh, American 10th Tank Division and the 103rd Infantry rolled into this little Alpine village to take possession of the houses. And the occupants were given 15 minutes to pack up and leave. One person was not best pleased about this. The person on the left, you may or may not recognize him. The person on the right is not actually the soldier he encountered. Um, I know that person's name, I'll tell you his name shortly, but he is a person of the same rank from the same uh, division, so he, he would look something like that in his uniform. They met each other um, in the staircase of the Grand House where the tall German octogenarian walked down the stairs and said, I am Richard Strauss, composer of Salome and Rosenkavalier. And he might have added of Electra, his 1909 opera based on the very same Eur Euripides play that Milton refers to in his sonnet. Now, what happened next is quite a surprise, what, because one day before the US Army had discovered the concentration camp at Dachau, two weeks before the uh, British Army had discovered Bergen Belsen. So you might have expected the young Jewish lieutenant at the bottom of the stairs to say, Yes, and I'm Attila the Hun, get on your bike, Gramps. That's not what happened. He paused for a moment, nodded in recognition, and when the main force came up uh, a few hours later, this is what they saw, off limits. Uh, Richard Strauss, in gratitude for the soldier for sparing his house, uh, wrote an oboe concerto, which he dedicated to another American soldier in the same division who had asked him why he'd never written an oboe concerto that's now celebrated as one of Strauss's most loved works. Um, Milton never wrote a poem for his soldier, but that's because he never met him. Um, we're often told by Milton scholars that the, that the boorishness of this nameless soldier, he doesn't have a name or rank even, is in contrast with the great Emathian conqueror, Alexander the Great. But the reason he's nameless is because Milton never met him. And the reason he never met him was that on the 13th of November, the um, trained bands of London went out on Turnham Green and in a minor skirmish, which they won, they, they turned the king's forces back. Had that not happened, somebody would have come knocking on Milton's door and that somebody would have had a name and a rank. We can only conjecture as to what would have happened then. Maybe Milton would have run for his life. Maybe Milton would have stood his ground and been cut down, which means nobody would ever have to read Paradise Lost. Or just possibly, he might have met the same good fortune that Richard Strauss met with his soldier. And let me emphasize the hero of the story, of the Richard Strauss story, is not Richard Strauss, who's rather uh, off-putting with his sense of entitlement. The real hero is the soldier at the bottom of the stairs who was moved by his music. If Milton had met this soldier, uh, it's entirely plausible that he would have written a poem for him. And I think I know how it would have begun. Because Milton, in his sonnet, says, I can spread your name. And so many of Milton's sonnets begin with a proper name. Cromwell, our chief of men. Fairfax, whose name in arms through Europe rings. Harry, whose tuneful and well-measured song. Vain, young in winters, but in sage councils old. Lawrence, a virtuous father, virtuous son. Those are all the opening lines of Milton's sonnets. Uh, Wordsworth imitates Milton when in a sonnet he wrote begins, Milton, thou shouldst be living at this hour. Um, so it's entirely plausible, I think, that Milton would have written a sonnet to the soldier who spared his house, which brings me to, for me, is the most moving part of this story, that the name of the soldier who confronted Richard Strauss and showed mercy is, could not be more appropriate. His name was Lieutenant Milton Weiss. <laughs> <clears throat> which makes me want to say, Milton, thou shouldst be living at this hour. Well, we're now at half past. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to segue into, into 
Paradise Lost and to a somewhat lighter note. And I'm going to go back to, I've been teaching at Western, teaching Paradise Lost, teaching Milton at Western for 30 years. I want to take you back to what was a traumatic experience for me 30 years ago in my very first Milton class when I was in my 20s and somewhat naive and nervous. There was an older student in the class, a mature student, about 20 years older than me. I still remember his name, still picture him. His name was George Simic. It's George, it's George is here today. It's a long shot. He, he, he was then uh, lived in London. Um, and what happened was this. I was giving a class on Paradise Lost, trying my best to convince the students that Eve is not stupid. Because Milton's Eve, like the biblical Eve, has always run into this problem of looking stupid for believing a talking snake. Why did she not suspect something when a snake started talking to her? I mean, this, um, this criticism of Eve goes all the way back to the early Christian fathers. It's much older, older than, much predates Milton. Anyway, in my class, I have to give a passionate defense of Milton's Eve. I made the terrible mistake of asking George a rhetorical question. I said, George, do you think that Eve is stupid? And he, without batting an eyelid, he replied, she's not too bright. At which point the whole class erupted with laughter. My credibility was dead, and it's taken me 30 years to get over the, um, the, the trauma. Um, now, this is a problem that all Milton scholars and teachers face. How do you teach Paradise Lost and try to make the case that Eve is not stupid? <clears throat> And the usual go-to authorities are theologians such as St. Augustine. But then a couple of years ago, it occurred to me that there's another way of thinking about this. The way Satan deceives Eve is like the, the technique is like that of a con, a con man in the modern time. Every, you can't open your email without seeing attempts to, to fish you or con you. So I looked into uh, um, con confidence tricks. So I came across this book written in 1922 by a, uh, a man who calls himself, I'm pretty sure it's a pseudonym, Edward H. Smith, who had recently been released from prison. <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is George's quotation. This is the stereotypical picture of Eve um, <clears throat> being not too bright. <clears throat> this, this is the book which... Um, I had, to get, I had to order it from into the library loan in, 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 in Buffalo. Um, Edward H. Smith um, practiced a stunt that's not unlike Satan's. He didn't have a talking snake, but he had a talking typewriter. And this con scam that he played in the, uh, uh, shortly after World War I, um, he told a group of rich bankers that he had invented a typewriter that could pick up electronic signals from the air, from the spoken voice, and could then talk to, to you. It, it basically invented the idea of the internet, um, but he didn't actually invent the internet. He demonstrated his idea to these bankers. And remember, you've got to remember things like radio were very recent inventions, so there was a, an appetite for the latest te technological breakthrough. So all these bankers were in this room watching and listening in amazement as Edward Smith would ask the typewriter questions and the typewriter would type the answers in response. What they didn't know is that behind the paper-thin walls were Edward Smith's colleagues hearing every word, looking up the Encyclopedia Britannica to give the answers, and then by a complex system of levers and pulleys, uh, typing on their machine that would make the typewriter in the next room give out the answer. Um, the bankers paid $60,000 for the invention, which was a huge sum in the, uh, around the year 1920, and they thought they had ripped the con man off because the, 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 they thought they'd got a great deal. He lay skipped town. They were left talking to the typewriter that wasn't talking back. The, the, the parallels with, with Milton are quite close. Before going any further, I should point out one huge important difference between Milton's version and the biblical version. Um, and Milton is not often given the credit he deserves for this. And it was this one thing that made me think of confidence men. Um, 
the, when you read the story of Adam and Eve in the Bible, the first surprise is just how short it is. Just a couple of verses, well, like, like not even a, a full page. The serpent just rolls up to Eve, starts speaking. Eve speaks back. No surprise at hearing the serpent speak. No need for explanation at hearing the serpent speak. And um, they might be in Narnia uh, for, for all of the... Uh, laid-back attitude, and the early Christian fathers had two views of this. Um, one was that Eve, being a new creature, might not know that animals can't speak. The other view was that animals could, in fact, speak before, be, be, before the fall. This was very much a, a minority view. Milton does something which is much more imaginative and goes a long way to making his version believable. Milton, Satan, in The Serpent, claims he is able to speak because he himself ate the, ate the forbidden fruit. So with this brilliant solution, brings together two problems, and to create a very elegant solution, Satan, the serpent's most powerful argument in Paradise Lost is its ability to argue. Um, but Milton goes further than that, and it was uh, Edward Smith's book that made me appreciate the technique of Satan as con man. Edward Smith, uh, after serving time in prison, wrote this book as Repentance, and in it he gives a very valuable, um, the full title of his book is um, Confessions of a Confidence Man, a Handbook for Suckers. It's still very useful today because he outlines the the classic techniques of, a, of, of, a, of con man psychology, identifying the six stages that a successful con goes through. And um, Milton, Milton's temptation in Paradise Lost fits the picture perfectly so much so it makes me wonder if, if Smith had been reading Milton. But the six stages he names are these. Uh, foundation work, the approach, the build up, the convincer, uh, the hurrah and the in and in. Uh, wonderful, these, I love those slangy jazz age uh, names. Uh, but the strangest thing, we think of Milton as being a rather grandiloquent poet, but some of those very expressions actually occur in Milton's account of the, of the temptation. Start with the foundation work. When Satan first hears, the way Satan hears about the prohibition is he, he, he's standing behind a bush and he overhears Adam and Eve talk about it. And one of the things which Milton realizes, and Edward Smith does too, is that prohibition is always good for gangsters. I mean, Edward Smith was flourishing in the time of prohibition and in the Garden of Eden there's a prohibition too on, on the forbidden fruit. And Satan instantly in, intuits that God is forbidding knowledge. Now, in fact, he, it's more complicated than that. He's, it, the apple is just an apple. Um, but Satan's response, um, <clears throat> sus knowledge forbidden, suspicious, reasonless. Why should their Lord envy them that? Can it be sin to know? Can it be death? Oh, fair foundation laid whereon to build their ruin. Notice the metaphor there of a foundation for a ruin. The full, the paradox is intended. And ruin plays on a Latin sense of falling, um, which is what the word orig originally meant. Um, but the, uh, the very word foundation, and Satan's lucked out, because usually with, with a, if you're a con artist, you have to come up with some scheme that hooks the mark. God's done it already for Satan with, with this prohibition. Satan's next step is, and this is always in, in any con, it's a crucial stage, the approach. The when the con man first approaches the mark is a, is, is, it has to be done right. Many con artists, uh, the approach is uh, meticulously prepared with stunts and props and a backup team. Often it will be a contrived accident where the uh, a con man will come to the rescue and uh, save the mark, thereby winning their trust. Satan's got this great idea of the talking snake, but he knows it's a mistake to play that card too soon. Uh, if he were to just approach Eve, as the biblical snake does, and starts talking, she'd be instantly suspicious. He has to lure her in. So Milton describes it like this. 
Satan, uh, it's an illustration by Gustav Dore of, this, of the serpent approaching Adam and Eve. In fact, in Milton, he just approaches Eve. <clears throat> um, but his very first words to her are not anything about having eaten an apple. In fact, they're not anything about his being able to speak. He apologizes for intruding on her private space. And his very first word, wonder not, is calculated to excite her wonder. He knows she's going to be gobsmacked when she hears a talking snake. But, but he is not saying, oh, in case you're wondering why I can talk to you, that would be a wrong move and make her suspicious. He wants to get her to ask him. So rule number one, give, make the mark feel they're in control. Wonder not, sovereign mistress, if perhaps thou canst, who art sole wonder, much less arm thy looks, the heaven of mildness with disdain, displeased that I approach thee thus and gaze insatiate. It's perfect handling of the, of the approach. Um, the next stage, <clears throat> build up. This is where, say, this is where the serpent explains in response to Eve's question, why are you talking to me? You're a snake. Um, he explains that he came across a tree and ate from the fruit. Crucially, he does not say which tree. That, would, again, would be too quick a move. He wants to whet her curiosity. It was a tree, as yet unspecified. And hearing this story, and, and he describes how he wound himself around the tree and all the other animals looked on, envying uh, this great uh, privilege that he had, where he alone could reach the fruit. One of the con man's greatest assets is everybody else will envy you. <clears throat> After the build-up, the next stage is the convincer. And Edward Smith explains, with the convincer or payoff, you give a small token reward, just enough to string the mark along. Preferably, it should be some entirely illusory reward, such as junk bonds, something of no value. But, but if you have to make an investment, it's worth it. And um, <clears throat> uh, Satan's convincer for Eve is the beauty of her person, the drop-dead gorgeous naked woman standing right in front of him. Now, critics have long recognized that Satan is flattering Eve, and he is, but it's much more than that. She really is the most beautiful presence in the garden, and the serpent's ability to see that and appreciate it is very persuasive evidence that he's gained knowledge. Not only has he gained the ability to speak, but he's gained the ability to make distinctions and to realize that Eve is drop-dead gorgeous. And while she, is, to her credit, she doesn't fall for the flattery, but she does fall for the illusion of his new knowledge. Um, Eve is then hooked enough to want to know which tree. And this it becomes a crucial stage in the temptation. And Edward Smith says the next stage is called the hurrah. And the hurrah is the make or break moment in any con. <clears throat> Here we see Eve. Eve has arrived at the tree and she realizes it is the one tree that she's forbidden to eat from, the tree of knowledge. And so she is, her hopes have been built to be dashed. And to her credit, she says, I'm, I can't eat from this tree. Now, Edward, this is the hurrah. Um, what is the hurrah? Edward Smith tells us it is a sudden, seemingly unforeseen, unplanned crisis. A crisis that was not part of the, not part of the deal, the plan between the con artist and the mark, but it requires a leap of faith on the part of the mark. If you've done the previous steps right, the mark will be ready to take that leap of faith and then, th then they're yours. Many marks, even if they still trust the con man, lose their nerve when the hurrah happens and they turn and walk away. And for a moment, it looks as if Eve would do that, just that and, and the game is over. Serpent, we might have spared our coming hither, fruitless to me, though fruit be here to excess. Notice the two puns. Fruitless to me is an obvious pun. I can't eat that fruit. It's a futile journey. 
The other pun, which is, as Christopher Rex pointed out many years ago, is Milton's pun, not Eve, is on the word excess. Though fruit be here to excess, all Eve means by that is I can't even eat the fruit, even though there's a lot of fruit here. But the other sense of excess, which was very common in 17th century English, in the sense of sin, transgression, is present too. Milton's voice behind Eve is saying, there will indeed be fruit to excess here, more than you realize. Uh, Eve does not walk away. And the reason it's called the hurrah is if the mark doesn't walk away, then the con man and his, and his accomplices yell, hurrah! So if the other devils were watching this unfold on the big screen back in hell, as soon as Eve doesn't walk away, hurrah, the thing's not going to walk. We still have a chance. But she doesn't yet eat the apple. Often with a hurrah, that's enough to, to make the mark bite. Uh, Eve is still saying no, so Satan now uses the last and deadliest resource of the con man, which in Smith's terms is the in and in. And before he does it, it requires all of his, um, all of his rhetorical skills of persuasion, and Milton compares him to an orator in a lovely simile. And what I love about this simile is the language invites us to picture a, an orator in ancient Greece or Rome, but also the words are calculated to picture uh, Satan as an upright serpent, whose very body language makes him convincing. As one of old, some orator renowned in Athens or free Rome, where eloquence flourished since mute, to some great cause addressed, stood in himself collected, while each part, motion, each act, one audience, ere the tongue, sometimes in height began, as no delay of preface brooking through his zeal of right. So standing, moving, or to height upgrown, the tempter, all impassioned, thus began. And that, that description could work with Cicero, and the words like motion and part and in height are all rhetorical terms. For in height could mean the high style of an oration, the peroratio. But it could also imply the orator standing to his full height. But if you're a serpent and going upright, and Satan is described as being like a cylindrical um, coil of serpents that rises fold above fold, a surging maze. The, so this, far from being a, a transparent disguise, Milton makes you feel that the serpent's body is made for high oratory. If this serpent had addressed the Senate of Rome, he would have had them on, uh, on their feet after five minutes uh, urging, et Carthage delenda est, and Carthage must be destroyed, which took the elder Cato a lot of persuading. Um, but the, uh, the key part of the in and in, and um, uh, Milton, Milton accords with this perfectly, is when the con man puts his own assets into the deal too to reassure the mark that everything is safe. And Satan does that when he makes a new claim that he's not made before. He's already told Eve that he's able to speak because he ate from an apple. And with the hurrah, she realizes it is the one apple that she's forbidden to eat. His argument, look at me. I ate it. Nothing happened to me. You've got nothing to worry about. Hooked on phonics worked for me. Oh, no, it's more than that. It's, it's hooked on phonics work for me, and I'm still here. If this apple is going to kill you, how do you explain my still being here? It's, it is a, an illogical argument because there is a crucial difference with Satan elides. Um, he, the serpent was never told not to eat the apple. Eve was. So there is no parallel at all. Um, even if this were a real serpent relating a real experience, it would be a fallacious argument. The, uh, Eve was prohibited. The serpent was not. But Eve falls for it. She falls for the argument. The in and in is, it's, uh, it's my asses too. We're in this together. They're not in it, to, not in it to, to, together. But Eve is reassured by that argument and takes the leap, but only after six stages 
of the confidence, uh, confidence man. Anyway, that's my case for Eve. If you still, if George were here, I would say, George, if you still think Eve was stupid, um, I wonder how you would fare with the talking typewriter stunt because there were some really smart people who fell for that one. That's the trouble with contracts. You, they look transparent afterwards. Hindsight is always 2020. When you're falling for them at the time, they're so persuasive. And many people are too embarrassed afterwards to lodge a complaint because the humiliation of having been a sucker is, is so great. Uh, Eve, Eve does fall for, for, Satan's, for Satan's scam, but she's no pushover. And I think it's to Milton's credit that Milton's Eve is no pushover. Thank you. questions so we've got time there's also opportunity to come up and look at those first editions if you would if you'd like to do that yeah there's not doing the same thing as Smith is providing a kind of a don't do this sort of guide to not be introduced by by evil this is part of the point here to provide us with a higher on how to be better able to try to seduce I, you know I, I think there's something in that um, um, Milton does subscribe to the view that the, to the Sydney idea that the purpose of poetry is to teach and delight. So I think that he also knows he has to be entertaining, but I also think he's trying to make sense of Genesis as so many people before him have tried to do. And I think he has more success than anyone before him in coming up with a plausible account of how... Um, a satanic deceiver can make the, a bad reason look, look like, like a good one. Um, and Milton is, I think, uh, it's in his prose work area, Pachitica too, the idea of a good temptation. We can learn from temptation. When you were taking, talking about the steps of the, uh, the uh, comment, I know that that book was also uh, very influential on the, uh, the Sting, the Robert Redford, Paul Newman movie. And I was, I was just wondering if, because uh, many of the same steps, I think even the, the movie's broken into the chapters. of the. And did you have that in mind as well when you were conceiving of this, this presentation? You know, it's, it, uh, thank you for that. Uh, um, um, I think that the uh, chapter titles in the Sting are a little a little different. I don't think I don't think they're ex the exact same, same terms. Um, since reading the Edward Smith book, I've become very interested in Conmen, uh, including 16th and 17th century ones. Um, and on the when I, when I gave a version of this paper in Exeter in England uh, a year ago, flying back on the plane, there was that Will Smith. Um, uh, movie about the confidence man. It too was written to script as if, by, as if, as if uh, Edward Smith had g g given the plot line. Um, uh, so yes, I, uh, I, in the 16th, 17th century, um, the, key, uh, the, the, the main figure is Thomas Decker, who's both a playwright and wrote po a, a popular text of, of criminal cant of the slangs that criminal use and the particular little, little um, cheats and, and deceptions that, that they practice. So yeah, there's been an underworld, like guild of, uh, of con men um, since time immemorial, I think, yeah. <clears throat> okay, well. If you want to uh, come up and have a look at the first editions, you're, you're, you're m m more than welcome to do that. You can uh, be able to see that Greek, Greek poem and uh, uh, relish the uh, humiliation of poor William Marshall who was tricked into, into insulting himself with that engraving. Thank you.